right, we are here. I know we're a little tardy, everyone, sorry. Um, but you know, we've got some important people who had to, you know, kind of go over some important barriers to make sure that we had the link in. But anyway, anyway, we are here without further ado. Welcome back to Faithfully Speaking. I am your host, Melissa Wade in the water. And yes, we are a podcast of good, healthy, positive, and informative conversations about various topics. The conversations we hope will inspire and uplift those who are watching like yourself in hopes that it will inspire and encourage you to the point where you will go out and you will inspire someone else with the information that we share with you. So this month, we are continuing to recognize Women's History Month by shining a light on some of the women that are movers and shakers, talented in their own rights, overcomers over crazy circumstances at times, and they are sharing that story. Now, last week, we were blessed to uh, talk with the queen of gospel music, our very own Pastor Shirley Caesar. And if you missed it, you need to check out in our archives that interview. She was absolutely wonderful and shared so many wonderful things that some of you may not have known about Mama Shirley, as I call it, Pastor Shirley Caesar. So today we are in the state, in our state's capital of Raleigh, North Carolina, with a woman that many are keeping their eye on because she is uh, truly dedicated to making North Carolina, Raleigh, a place uh, for all of equality for all. She's a mover and a shaker. She is doing her own thing. And, you know, this is not her last stop. And that's why we are keeping our eye on it. And we want to find out more about her. So please, without further ado, help me welcome to Faithfully Speaking, Raleigh's own Raleigh City Councilwoman, Stormy Fort. How you doing? Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I look, I got big shoes to uh, follow after if you had uh, Pastor Caesar on last week. Uh, <laughs> dynamic and a phenomenal woman and a great community community leader and advocate. So uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a, a monumental task that you've got me coming in behind her. Don't even try it. <laughs> you know what? I have been following you. I have been reading on you and I'm like, yeah, she's, uh, she's going places. So I want to get her early before she gets there. And then I really have to go through some major tasks <laughs> and hurdles to say, remember me? <laughs> Look, Melissa, you don't ever have to worry about that. Look, I, I'm always available whenever you need me. Well, I am. And we are, let's say it that way. We're so, so proud of you. You are the first African-American, first Black woman to serve on Raleigh City Council. Yay! Yeah, that's right. Right. We're so, so, so proud of you. Thank you so Thank very you. much. So let's just dive into this. Um, let's, we want to know it's Women's History Month. So mm -hmm. I like to go back and say, you know, let's find out a little history about our councilwoman, Stormy Ford. Tell us about your, your upbringing. I know you're a native of here in North Carolina. What inspired you, you know, as a, a young girl, as a child to even take on such a big responsibility and task? Well, I will say um, not only am I a native of North Carolina, I'm a native of Raleigh. So I'm a rarity. Born and raised here, went to Broughton High School. Um, but I would say my mom is probably one of those major influencers. Um, she sacrificed so much when I was younger to make sure I, you know, I had the best education when I was growing up. Um, and actually, believe it or not, I remember the first time I ever went into the voting booth. I went in with my mom. She took me to vote uh, when she's going in to vote for president. And it was back in 1976 when Jimmy Carter was running for president and we went in to go vote. So I actually remember my first introduction to the political arena. And that was actually through my mother. So, you know, she is uh, very instrumental and uh, very much one of the uh, motivating factors for me being in uh, political life today. Well, let us not forget, you said Brogdon High School. You didn't go any further because you also are a graduate from UNC. I'm a Carolina girl. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm a, a double Tar Heel and I went to uh, law school at North Carolina Central. So I'm yes. a, a legal eagle, a Tar Eagle, however you want to describe it. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time in Chapel Hill and some time in Durham. It's two of the best schools right here in North Carolina. So, Absolutely. yes. I just wanted to highlight that. And I know I saw that you were an advocate of watching UNC play basketball. It was cut short. Um, but there's always next year, yeah. next season, right? And, and love to watch uh, Coach Moten's team over at Central whenever I get a chance to watch them too. So I, I have the best of both worlds. I get to watch Carolina basketball and Central basketball. So it's great. And that is my brother. So yeah, big shout out <laughs> to Coach Moten. He's doing some wonderful things over there at North Carolina Central University. Absolutely. Amplified. Amplified. That's right. 
So as I said, I, I read your bio and I was looking at all the different things that you have done, are doing, and I'm like, whoo, <laughs> wow. You have volunteered for and served on so many wonderful programs and for our community. And, and now you hold one of the biggest titles of pretty much, I would like to say, being a servant of our community. What would you say drives you and motivates you to, to do this? Well, you know, one of the things that we're always taught um, to move, to whom much is given, you know, much is required. So, you know, being able to have the benefit of a wonderful education first here in uh, Wake County, the Wake County public school system, and then with our state system going to two state universities, I've had an opportunity to really be exposed to a lot and um, have an opportunity to have a really expansive network. And with that, that gives me an opportunity to be able to provide um, open doors for other people coming behind us. I love working with young people. I love working with our youth. Uh, it's great to have an opportunity to go in and talk to a lot of our young folks about um, potential, you know, career paths for them. You know, of course, we got a lot of folks who, you know, our kids want to be athletes. They want to be music entertainers and all those sorts of things. But, you know, recently I find myself talking to a lot of our kids about, hey, there are opportunities that you can go to a local community college get your HVAC certification, get some other certification and make more than I make as an attorney. Um, you know, so just really giving our, our young people an opportunity to see that there's so many things out available to them. The world is like their, you know, it's like their canvas for them to be able to go out and paint. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine over the weekend. Her daughter is actually getting ready to prepare to study abroad next year. Um, and when I was at Carolina, uh, that was not something that people really talked to me about having the opportunity to do. But, you know, the world's an open book. We've got so much technology and stuff that, you know, I didn't have 30 years ago when I was in school. Yeah, I just, kids, you know, look, you know, look for any, you know, any opportunity that's presented to you and seize it and take advantage of it. Because, you know, while you're young and you're still under your parents' roof and they're paying your bills, great time to explore, uh, to, you know, to go out and see the world, experience the world. Uh, but then, you know, there are a lot of young people who also want to give back. And it's great, you know, working with young people who do service work um, and want to give back to their communities as well. So it's always about trying to pay it forward to the next generation and uh, serve those who came before us. We've got senior citizens who need help uh, in a variety of ways and just to see our young people be very, very active in the community. So that's one of the things that really motivates me and drives me to be able to help our young people move in very uh, different directions. I love it. And, and following you and reading about you, you're very much on, you know, just including everybody, being inclusive and making sure that everybody has their rights. What would you say are some of uh, the projects or maybe efforts that you are mo most passionate about? Well, in this particular term, I'm going to be working a lot dealing with the uh, homelessness issue. Uh, certainly, if you've been in the Triangle area for the last, you know, three to five years, you've seen that our homeless population has really escalated here in Raleigh and uh, you know, more collectively throughout the, the Triangle area. Uh, so I'm going to be leading a task force. So it's going to be a joint task force between the city and the county. We're going to bring in a variety of folks to serve on that task force. But what we want to do is look at what are some permanent solutions that we can work towards uh, as relates to trying to uh, tackle the homelessness uh, crisis that we're, we're seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, Raleigh is really growing. We've got a, a number of very large companies coming in going to be some great employment opportunities, but we have to make sure that the people who've been here are not pushed out and not left behind. And so my focus in this term is really going to be, you know, how do we work with our folks who are experiencing homelessness or having, you know, some, you know, challenges accessing, you know, quality, affordable housing, you know, we, you know, housing can be affordable, but we want it also to be habitable. And we want to make sure that it's uh, a great place for people to live, even if it's at a lower price point. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's going to be one of my main driving forces. You know, how do we get uh, folks out of the situation with homelessness? And uh, coupled with that is making sure that we've got adequate, what they call wraparound services, because uh, oftentimes people are experiencing homelessness, but there's something that triggered that event to get them into that particular situation. So, you know, how do we take a holistic approach and make sure whatever the contributing factors were that led that person to experience homelessness, we're providing some services to kind of, you know, up, lift them up to make sure once we get them into permanent housing, they're able to stay there and maintain it. I, I love it. So you're not just, you, you know, solving where they are right now. You want to go back and, and find out what brought you to this point so we can solve it from there that right. people from 
continuing to be in this whole loophole. I, I love it. I, I love it. See, Carolina girls, we think in the same way. <laughs> so, um, so, so look, in 2020, you were selected to serve as the district representative for the city of Raleigh. Mm -hmm. First black woman, as I mentioned, to serve on the city council. What would you say are some of your greatest challenges on being the first? Um, you know, there's always the perception that, um, and, you know, it, particularly in political spaces, we've been so accustomed to seeing, um, you know, white men being our elected officials from president on down. Certainly we, you know, we've had the opportunity to have the experience with President Obama leading the, the, leading the ticket and becoming the president. Certainly we've had the experience of our great sister, uh, Kamala Harris serving as vice president. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're starting to see that the dynamics are shifting in different places. We've got more black women being elected mayors across the uh, country, more black women getting elected into um, statewide roles across the country. So, um, but being in this particular position for me, um, I think I can't necessarily say it's been a challenge being the first. Um, and a large part of that is growing up in Raleigh. I've got so many family and friends and classmates and folks who've known me for um, so many years. They really gave a lot of support um, mm -hmm. that I find when I move around in the community, people are excited uh, to see me and have conversations with me about serving on the council. Um, and it's great, you know, when folks say, oh, my goodness, we can't believe in 2020, that's the first time we've had a black woman actually serve on the Raleigh City Council. Yes. So I can't necessarily say that it's really been um, a, a challenge in a negative way. Uh, I can say that a lot of people are really embracing having uh, the diversity on the council. And now, uh, for the first time in the history of the Raleigh City Council, we have three African-Americans serving. Um, we actually have two black women. So now it's me um, and Mary Black out of District A and then um, Council Member Corey Branch out of District C. So we're the three. And for the first time in the history of the council, we have six women serving and two men. So the women are actually the majority on the council in the, in the history of uh, the Raleigh City Council. So we've been able to take uh, diversity and really uh, be able to like escalate it um, in this last uh, election cycle. Absolutely love it. I, I didn't know that, but that is women are taking over. What was oh, that? Yeah. Brown, it's a man's world, but you can't have nothing without a woman or a girl. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Ooh, all right. All right. So, as I said, watching you do what you do, you are truly making strides and you're making changes. Um, and, and as I said before, I, I don't see this being uh, the top of it all for you. <laughs> Can you let us in? Give us some what's going on. What's next for Councilwoman Stormy Ford? Well, right now I'm just working on, on this term. So like I said, you know, being able to work on the homelessness issue is something that's going to be really, really important to me. Um, and then having partnerships with other folks across uh, the community. So um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, two of my really good friends who are also elected officials, uh, we're able to pull off a monumental task. Uh, Judge Ashley Parker Dunstan has this brainchild with um, wanting to open up a uh, legal services center in the Wake County uh, courthouse. Mm -hmm. And what that particular center does, it helps folks who um, come into the courthouse. Um, by right, if you are charged with a crime, you're entitled to have an attorney appointed to you. Um, other cases, you don't necessarily have the right to have counsel appointed. So if you've got an issue dealing with child support, child custody, uh, other types of civil cases, you're not entitled to have legal representation. And what we found is that a lot of folks who are low income folks, uh, quite frankly, a lot of folks from our black and brown communities were coming into the courthouse and really just being completely overwhelmed by the system. So Judge Parker Dunstan had this uh, great idea that if we, if we, if we developed a, um, community legal services center in the courthouse, folks could come in and get some assistance and some resources with those cases that they weren't entitled to have representation. So she and I had a conversation about it. And she also talked to my good friend, um, the, the chair of the Wake County Commission, uh, Shanika Thomas. And so the two of them were able to pull this together. The city of Raleigh was able to contribute some money and they were able to launch that. And I think they actually served over a thousand people and they're only open for half a day. But those thousand people are people who've come in and really, really been struggling with um, how to access the legal system and trying to have it on as much of a, a, a level playing field as you possibly can get. Um, and so that's one of the initiatives that I was proud to support uh, on behalf of my, my two friends who were involved in that initiative. But 
again, it's about being servant leaders. When you look at those of us who are black women who are currently serving uh, in different roles across the, uh, the triangle area, you know, we're all about, you know, how can we be of service to our communities um, and not just specifically black and brown folks, but really the entire community, particularly for people who are disadvantaged, you know, how do we level the playing field? How do we provide resources? You know, how do we figure out ways to open up doors um, so that everybody feels like they are a valued part of this community? I mean, that's really what it's all about. You know, how do we make sure that, you know, everybody's paying taxes. We want to make sure that people are getting a return on that investment for their taxes. We want to make sure that people uh, feel very uh, comfortable that their government, their local government is working on their best behalf. So. Yeah. I mean, you know, we perish for lack of knowledge, for lack of wisdom. And I appreciate you and, you know, your your coworkers just coming together because what we as minorities, not just, you know, African-Americans, but, you know, Hispanics, the rest, what we don't know is what hurts us. Mm -hmm. And if we are in that sector of people who are not privy to that information because we don't have the funds to pay for it, so to speak, then once you educate, you know, a, a block of us, then we're able to take that information and and take it on to the next generation and generation and generation. And therefore, we're able to break those generational curses by what you guys are volunteering to do. So, Councilwoman Fort, I truly appreciate it. I know I just said a whole mouthful right there. <laughs> I mean, that's where I am. That's not what I believe. And you know, um, women uh, representatives such as yourself with a passion for the people. It's what's going to make a difference and allow us to get out of that poverty, out of that homelessness. That is your um, task while you're there right now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, we all of us who are, are servant leaders definitely appreciate the support that we get from the community. Uh, you know, sometimes it's you know the challenges can be you know tough, and we got to figure out creative solutions. But you know that's what we feel like we're here for. That's what our mission is, and so we're happy to do the work of service because the people elected us in roles to do that. And so we're happy to have the opportunity to carry that out. So, so as the people that you serve, what can we do to, I guess, maybe help you guys along? What what, where can we go to find out information to help you um, get and um, and be able to solve what you have in front of you? Well, you know, one of the things that's always valuable, we always love to hear from the public uh, when the issues come up. Folks will call us. They will send us emails and give us their thoughts and opinions about a variety of subjects. And I think, you know, all of us who serve in those positions love to hear, you know, from our constituents. Uh, Certainly we hear from people when things are not going well and, uh, you know, it's, it's not great. Definitely would love to hear from people when, you know, things are going well, that when they think we're making the right decisions, when they think we're doing the right things. Um, so certainly that is one way to be helpful. The other thing I will say is that, you know, where people can, you know, pay it forward as well. Um, you know, there are a number of things that are happening for a different example. Um, I know several years ago, a friend of mine and I worked on an initiative with the uh, Wake County public school system where kids were getting behind on their lunch accounts and um, weren't able to get hot lunches. And so, you know, you can always go into your, if your kids at school, you can always go in and say, Hey, if there's a kid that, you know, needs an extra $20 on their lunch books, want to make sure this kid has a hot meal instead of necessarily paying for the person in front of you at Starbucks to get or behind you to get a cup of coffee or breakfast at McDonald's, you know, take that $20 and take it to your local public school and make sure a kid is getting a hot lunch uh, every day. Uh, so it's just the small things that we can all do as a community to make sure we're contributing uh, to the benefit of those around us who are in need. So that's just one example of things, small things that people can do that you don't necessarily have to reach out to me to do it. You can do it on your own. I love it. You know, you have no idea how many school lunches you just paid for right there. OK, <laughs> <laughs> I, hope so. I hope so. So, yeah, that, that's just one example. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you. Uh, my last question to you, because I'm like, OK, I mean, she might be, you know, competing with me. So I don't know if I really want to ask her about her radio show. <laughs> <laughs> but I know it's a plethora of information. So tell us a little bit about your radio show and what it consists of. So that's the art of listening. And I, I kind of stopped it a little bit during COVID. I'm going to pick up a couple of episodes here and there moving forward. Um, but my radio show is a, is a community show. Uh, so I've had, you know, um, coaches and athletes and entrepreneurs and community leaders, 
certainly elected officials and candidates come on and just, you know, for an hour, just talk about, you know, what they're doing in their particular space. Uh, like I said, I hadn't done it a, a lot since we've been in uh, COVID because I like to do it in the studio, uh, but I probably will pick up and do a few episodes over the course of the year, kind of work it into my schedule. Uh, but I'll tell you the truth. One of the things I'm enjoying is just really being able to get out and move around in the community. People are like, you're everywhere. I try to be everywhere because I feel like that's the best way that you can find out what's going on. You've got to be able to go out and meet your constituents where they are, hear different issues. Um, I hear a lot of stuff that I don't necessarily know what's going on until I, I'm actually out in the community talking to folks. And so a lot of my time on the weekends is you know, tied up going to different events and meetings and things like that, which I enjoy, but also feel like that's a part of my responsibility as an elected official. So trust me, I'm not competing with you at all because I'll just be doing a little dab here and there. I'm just kidding. And trust me, the things that you're talking about will give them more wisdom. I could I could probably give them at all with politics. I'm like, you leave it to the professionals and you definitely are. And that is another reason why I am so proud of you. I stay in my lane, which is writing and talking, <laughs> not necessarily about politics, but we definitely need representatives like yourself, Councilwoman, for it to, uh, to represent us and to know that we have somebody with the knowledge and the power and the education, the brain power and the heart for their community to represent us. So thank you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on today and giving me an opportunity to tell a little bit about my story and some of the work I'm doing. We are so glad that you came on Raleigh's very own. Before we get out of here, is there anything last minute that I didn't cover that you would like to share with the people before we? Um. No, I, like I said, I think the only thing I would say is that, you know, in the small ways that people can contribute, be it, you know, doing some volunteer work, you know, paying it forward, any of those types of things. I think the more people are engaged and even doing like just small things within their space, collectively, that helps make the city of Raleigh a much better place. And so for all my folks who are out doing grassroots work and activism work and all types of work, I applaud you and I thank you so much for the things that you do to contribute to the city. That's what this podcast is all about. She has framed it up. It's about encouraging, uh, inspiring one another, supporting one another. Yes, we are brothers and our sisters keepers. And this is just one lady right here that is keeping a whole lot of us together and inspired. Councilwoman Fort, thank you. Thank you so very much, my sister Stormy. We will continue to support us. You just let us know what we need to do right here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time and I've enjoyed the interview. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, y'all. Wrapping up another Faithfully Speaking. You know, as I like to say, it, I'm just faithfully speaking. And that's what it's all about. Keeping you inspired and uplifted. Until next week, we will have on, and I think she mentioned, a mayor. First Black mayor of Durham. Yes, Elaine O'Neill will be our next guest. So some wonderful and powerful women as we recognize Women's History Month. Until next week, God bless you. I love you. Grace and peace.